Hi, this is Dan Heisman and we're here to continue our series of YouTube videos to help you play chess better. We haven't done any opening tabiyas in a while, so I thought we'd do a little opening work. Um, a tabia is a table setter. It's a word that means it's the standard moves in an opening. So when you're learning an opening, you don't want to memorize an entire book. It's way too much. And you don't want to memorize nothing because then you don't know, have any idea what the book moves are. So what you want to do is start with the main tabiyas. It's sort of like when you're looking at a whole tree of information, what you're really trying to learn is the main trunks and the main branches. So today we're going to look at a line in the French defense. So white plays e4, black plays e6 French defense. And white has basically five ways to play against the French defense. Of course, there's more than five, but there's five kind of major lines. The first one would be the King's Indian attack, where you just play d3, and then you play something like knight d2 so that pawn takes pawn, doesn't trade queens. And then you fee and ketter the bishop, that's King's Indian attack. The other second line that white needs to be aware of, that black needs to be aware of, that white could play is the exchange variation, where I recommend that people learn the line in John Watson's book, uh, play the French, where John Watson recommends the black castle queen side in this opening with some interesting play. The third way to play against the French is the advanced variation, where black immediately plays the break move c5. And I tell people, please don't play this as white unless you learn the book. It's a perfectly good opening for white, but it's very, very easy for black to get the advantage if white doesn't know what he's doing here. The fourth way to play, which is the way I've mostly played throughout my life, is to play the Tarish variation, knight to d2. And black has a couple of main lines. He could play knight f6, which is the line that I like to play for black when I played the French. And he could play the more positional move, c5. There's other moves as well, but that's the Tarish. The main line for white in the French is to play knight to c3. Okay, so black here has three main replies. He can play the um, take in the center, which could be the burn variation. Um, you know, there's some various names of the, of the uh, variations where you take the pawn. Um, black could play the winnower, bishop to b4, which uh, is a line that I used to play as well. Or he could play the classical move, knight to f6, which is what we're going to look at in this video a little bit. And now white has two major lines. Black's threatening to win the e-pawn. He's got two attackers and one defender. If you are interested in things like that, you can uh, take a look at my video, The Safety Table, which I think is a really good video for anybody rated up below 1400. Um, okay, so white needs to save the pawn. Uh, one way to do that is to simply push the pawn, which could lead to this what's called the Steinitz variation. Black will play knight d7 and then break with c5 again and finally white can develop the bishop and pin the knight with bishop g5 again sort of the classical variation and now black could transpose into the lines where he takes the pawn but the most common move is the classical line bishop e7 to get out of the pin but we're not going to talk about the most common move we're going to talk about the second most common move which is to play the McCutcheon variation, bishop to b4. Uh, we're going to use as a guide a book called The Modern French by Antic and Miksomovich. And in the book, they even give the name of McCutcheon. They say, famously named after John Lindsay McCutcheon, born 1857, died 1905. So I'll tell you a little story about the McCutcheon variation. When I was a developing player back uh, way back when uh, I would play against some of the players in my arch rival high school uh, I went to Hatper Horsham they went to Upper Moreland here in the suburbs of Philadelphia and my one of my friends was Lester Shelton and Lester Shelton's main defense against e4 was to play the McCutcheon variation and the McCutcheon variation was not very popular not too many people played it no, almost no grandmasters we know have played it and Lester would play it all the time, and he would say to me, Dan, the McCutcheon variation is perfectly good for black. And I'd say something like, okay, well, it seems to be when I play against you, but I, I have to wonder why the top grandmasters don't play it. If it was that good for black, they would play it more. 
Well, if we fast forward many, many years, we now have more objective ways of figuring these things out, which is we have very high level computers that can evaluate the positions. And computers think that the McCutcheon variation is perfectly legitimate, you know, just as good as anything kind of move. And that kind of justifies what Lester told me so many years ago, which is the McCutcheon is a good opening to play, but it's not only just a good opening in terms of evaluation for black, it's a good opening because it's a little bit tricky and if your opponent doesn't know what he's doing, you can get a nice, very nice position very quickly. And that's that's always a good thing. If you're rated if you're a low rated player, much more important than playing the lines that the Grandmaster plays is to play lines that it's very easy for your opponent to go wrong if they don't know what they're doing. Because when you play other low rated players and they don't know what they're doing, if you play an opening like, let's say, the London system for white and your opponent doesn't know what they're doing, they're probably going to end up okay anyway. But there's a lot of openings where if you play them and your opponent doesn't know what they're doing, things are going to go wrong very quickly. Uh, I always say to my students, if you want to play the white side of a Sicilian and you want to play open Sicilians, that's okay. It's, a, it's the most common Grandmaster lines. But you have to learn them for white. If you don't learn them from white, it's very easy to get a bad game with white. So here, this is a little bit true as well. If white has no idea what he's doing against the McCutcheon, he can get into some trouble. <clears throat> All right, so let's look at some of the main lines. Obviously, since black has allowed the pin to take place, white can try to take advantage of the pin with e5, and that's the main line. And that's the only line we're going to look at today. If you want to look at one of the side lines, you can look at the book I uh, the, the book we're look using is the Modern French, but as I said, by Antich and Maksimovich. But you can look in any book about these sidelines other than e5. But we're going to pretty much stick with e5. Now, if you're not familiar with this kind of tactic, you know, this defensive tactic, black to play and not lose a piece, then this is something you really want to learn because it comes up in a million different positions. Black is not losing a piece here. He's not losing a piece for the reason that the piece that's pinning the knight can be counterattacked. So what black must do, his only move, otherwise he could resign, is to play h6. And now clearly, for instance, if white plays bishop to h4 to keep the pin on, then black can play g5 and break the pin, and one way or another he's, he's not going to lose any material. Uh, if white plays bishop takes knight, pawn takes, you know, Black has these doubled pawns, but he can undouble his pawns at will, and he has the bishop pair, even though his queenside bishop isn't that strong. So black is extremely happy in this position. So the main lines here are bishop d2 is the main move, and we'll also look at bishop e3. Some grandmasters have been playing bishop c1 in the last dozen years or so. Um, that's not, uh, you know... It's not without its bite, but uh, a little bit outside the scope of our video today. All right, so the question is, what happens if black tries to take the knight and then take the g-pawn? And in fact, Stockfish says this may even be as good a line as any for white. So let's look at the greedy line first. e takes f6, h takes g5, f takes g7, rook g8. All right, and Stockfish thinks that white is okay here. But, if, but every time I've played this for black, I've always been extremely happy because most players with white don't really know how to play this kind of position anyway. They, they try to take advantage of this pawn on g7 instead of playing around it. Stockfish says here the best move for white is a3, and he gives a line like a3, bishop takes, pawn takes, queen f6, and now it gives the interesting move h4 for white. But almost nobody plays this for white. If they take the knight, it usually means they don't know what they're doing. And when they play rook g8, they more likely play a move like queen h5. Okay, well, here it looks like white's setting a trap because if rook takes g7, then queen h8 check. But actually, that doesn't even win either. After rook takes, queen check isn't even the best move. Black can save the rook by playing bishop f8. And Stockfish says the game is roughly equal here. But even better for black after queen h5 is to play queen f6. Simply avoiding all those kind of lines, leaving the bishop pinning the knight. And already the computer says that black's better. It gives 
White's best move is queen h7, queen takes g7, queen takes g7, rook takes g7, castle queen side, and here it gives the interesting move, knight d7. A lot of people are going to play their break move, c5, thinks knight d7 is the most accurate. All right, so let's go back to the start again. So how did we get in the McCutcheon? e4, e6, d4, d5, knight c3, knight f6, bishop g5, bishop b4. There's the, the key move to the McCutcheon. The McCutcheon is if white pins that knight, then you counter pin. This is not the winnower. In the winnower, black doesn't bring out the knight on the third move at all. This is the McCutcheon. e5, h6. So we've just seen that e takes f6, which Stockfish thinks is as good as anything, is not the main line. Black has not much to worry about. The main moves that we're going to look at today are bishop e3 and bishop d2. Bishop d2 is the main line, so let's start with bishop e3. And let's go over to the book and see what they say. Bishop e3, see page 301. Okay, he's... He says in the book, they say in the book, the best alternative to the main line. White wants to preserve the bishop even at the cost of a pawn. The battle will be sharp and uncompromising. Black now plays knight to e4. Okay, and white has a few moves here after knight to e4. Uh, let's take a look at the most common kind of attacks, which is when white brings out the queen to g4. The idea of queen g4 is hit this knight. It's not really being attacked by the pin knight yet. But to make black make a decision on how to stop queen takes g7, which is a major threat, black has a lot of ways of stopping it, and he has to decide which one to do. In the bishop e3 line, let's see what they're recommending here. They're recommending, um, well, they say king f8 is possible, and g6, and g5. Stockfish suggests king f8. Now, what's interesting about the McCutcheon is that you very often give up castling like this, and this happens in the French. And a lot of my students say, well, gee, what happens to this rook on h8? How's he going to get in the game? And the answer is, well, right now, that rook is doing a good job of guarding the king side, and he's going to be kind of the king's king side guardian there. And white has more space on the king side, so black needs some power on that side of the board to counteract white's possibilities of pushing the pawns down the board. So the rook's going to do a good job of that, while the other pieces are going to basically be playing on the queen side. Uh, in this position, Stockfish again recommends a3. Now this is a move a lot of humans wouldn't play because they'd be afraid of losing a pawn. And in fact, it's very dangerous for black to take these pawns a lot of times in the McCutcheon. Bishop takes, pawn takes is perfectly good, and now black should just break with c5, which is ironic. Here you have a chance to get a pawn that's not guarded on prees, and instead black puts a pawn on a square where it's attacked twice by the pawn on d4 and the bishop on e3, and only guarded once. But black shouldn't be worried about this. If white tries to win the pawn, which is not the most wonderful idea in the world, black can simply play queen a5, and hit all these weak pawns, and they start falling over. So white usually doesn't do that. There are some lines where white will take on c5. Here it suggests white should play bishop d3. Let's look what would happen if the knight takes the pawn instead. Knight takes c3, not a terrible move, but not number one. Bishop d3, aiming at the king side, just says, go ahead, lose some time. And now black has a little more problems trying to play c5 without the knight on e4 to support it. And he's got to get the knight back in the game. So the computer thinks that white has full compensation for the pawn here. It doesn't think anything more than that. It thinks the game's about even. All right, let's go back. So after king f8, let's suppose white doesn't play a3. What's it, what else is he going to play? Well, he's not going to play bishop d2 now. If he was going to do that, he would have played the bishop d2 line a couple moves ago. So he pretty much has no choice. He's, he's going to be sacrificing a pawn in this position one way or another. The nice thing for white is that black taking the pawn isn't really all that good. Let's take a look what happens if black tries to take with the knight. If he takes with the knight, white simply takes the bishop. Now he's threatening to take the knight. How does the knight save himself? 
Well, if he goes back to e4, now all these squares are covered, and white's going to be threading a move like f3 very soon. Uh, computer says he should play c3 first. Black should try to hold the knight with f5. Gives queen d1. Again, this knight has some problems. If the knight tries to go to g5 right away, knight e2, knight c6. Computer says white should be winning with best play here. Knight f4, threading knight g6. With a very bad position for really lost. Um, so winning this pawn for black is not the idea here. Uh, the, the main idea for black after a3, bishop takes, pawn takes, is to play c5, white will play bishop d3, and we get a more of a normal position here, normal for the McCutcheon. So here black has to decide between playing a move like h5, or maybe trying to take the pawn and hold on. Let's see what happens if he takes the pawn. Knight takes c3, white gets his pawn back, black develops the knight, and bishop d2 hitting that knight. f5 counterattacking. e takes f6. Queen takes f6, holds the knight. Queen f3, and white has a slight opening advantage, sort of a normal opening advantage here. All right, let's go back to the start again. So we've been looking at the e3 variation. e6, d4, d5, knight c3, knight f6, Bishop g5, bishop b4, the, the characteristic move of the McCutcheon, e5, h6 forced, bishop e3, knight e4, queen g4. Now, here we, we were look, just looking at the king f8 line. In the book, the authors actually recommend the ugly g6. They're the, one who's, they're the ones who call it ugly, not me. And they say this strategically ugly move became popular after Black discovered a plan connected with the attack on the white queen, which will become clear in a few moves further on. In the resulting position, the weaknesses created by this advance will be totally irrelevant. And they give a bunch of lines here. We can't go through all of them way outside the scope of our video. Obviously, our video is just an introductory video for the McCutcheon. If you want to really learn all the lines, you're going to need to pick up a book like this book or, uh, you know, go through it with an engine or even go through it with a with a opening a book on the French or an oak book like MCO 15 something like that just to give you more lines than what you can see in a in a half hour video okay so he gives a line a3 again bishop takes pawn takes c5 very similar ideas to before bishop d3 h5 counterattacking the queen if queen f4 then g5 with the knight and the queen guarding it. Looks like black's trying to commit suicide with his pawns, but not really. Queen f3, knight takes c3, d takes c5, and the engine again says the position is relatively even, but obviously imbalanced here. Good to know some of the ideas. Let's go to the main variation now. All right, so in the main variation of the McCutcheon, d, white is not sacrificing a pawn at all. He's simply going to guard c3 with the bishop. So bishop g5, bishop b4, McCutcheon, e5, h6. And when you play weak players, they don't always play bishop d2. Well, when you play strong players, they don't play it either, but then they're playing a book line. But bishop d2 is the main line. And now knight e4 is a famous super mistake here. If you play knight e4, it's black to, sorry, white to play and win. He simply takes off your knight with a discovered attack on your bishop. And if you take his bishop with check as his Vishenzug, <clears throat> of course, white's going to take back with the piece that is in danger of the knight, and white is just one apiece. <clears throat> so, of course, black cannot play knight e4 in that position. Knight e4, if you don't know that tactic for white and black, this is as good a time as any to learn it, which is... After bishop d2, so whoops, sorry, h6, bishop d2, knight e4, loses a piece. So what black has to do first is take that knight off the board. Bishop takes. Now a lot of beginners here play bishop takes c3. They don't want to double their pawns. 
But actually, if black's going to break with c5 and threaten to take this pawn at some point, it's actually better for white to have a pawn guarding it. And when he takes with the one pawn, he'll have another pawn guarding it. And if you take with the bishop, which is a very rare move, after knight e4, he's threatening this bishop anyway. If you try to save the bishop, black still has moves like c5. And if pawn takes, already black's getting tricks here. Knight takes f2. King takes f2, queen h4 check, picking up the bishop. If he takes with the bishop, just simply takes, takes, and now these pawns, I could get the pawn right away with queen a5 check. I could also play queen c7, hitting two pawns. And you know, white should never play moves like b4 here. You know, now queen takes c5 check. I'm not winning the rook because the queen's guarding it, but it's just silly to do that. So in this position, the e-pawn is much more valuable than the doubled c-pawn, and white should just play knight f3 with equality. All right, let's go back to our main line again. e4, e6, d4, d5, knight c3, knight f6, bishop g5, bishop b4, e5, h6, bishop d2, bishop takes c3. So the main line is that white will take with the pawn. And now white, black plays knight to e4, to get the knight centralized. Let me get to the right page number here so I can read you off what he has to say about it. Page 308. Okay, so... Uh, all right, so... I gave the wrong page number. Page uh, 314, okay. That makes me feel better. All right, so bishop d2, pawn takes. He says in the book, bishop takes c3 is a rarely played move. And he gives some of the ideas we just talked about. Okay, so now we've got the main move, queen to g4. This is kind of almost the tabi opposition. And again, we have this big break between the king f8 lines and the g6 lines. Stockfish and the authors of the book both recommend the same line, which is to play king f8. And again, you know, weaker players don't want to do that. Of course, you can't play castle. If you castle, he plays bishop takes h6 and you can resign. So it's got to be either g6 or king f8. <clears throat> In this case, the computer and the book recommend king f8. Let's take a look, look at the king f8 line here. Um, bishop d3, threatening to win a pawn with bishop takes d3. C, D takes E, queen takes E4. So black has nothing better than to take the bishop. White's not worried about not castling here. His king is in the center behind a wall of pawns. Black breaks with a C5 pawn. Again, black's not worried about losing the pawn and giving white all these isolated pawns. If white takes, which is a mistake, black should just play knight D7 and hit the two pawns. If white insists on trying to guard them, Black can attack them again, and now they're going to start to fall. So taking that pawn is not the right idea. Um, well, I shouldn't say taking the pawn and trying to hold it is not the right idea. So after c5, this is kind of almost a tabi opposition in itself for the McCutcheon. They say in the book that the, the main moves are d takes c5, f4, knight f3, and h4, where h4 is the main line h4. So let's take a look at h4 for a second. They say go to page 334. h4. What should black do? Uh, they're suggesting, they say black has two lines. They say queen a5 is a rarely used move. And they say c4 is the best plan. So c4 which does close off the queen side so that black doesn't get any pressure against the king. But obviously they have something specific in mind. Bishop e2. Knight c6. Play a few more moves. Rook h3, getting the rook into the attack here. It's called a rook lift. b5, going for a break on the queen side. Queen to f4. 
And that's probably a good place to stop. Stockfish thinks that black's much better in this position. After bishop d7, it gives minus 0. 0.6 to minus 0. 0.7. So that's pretty interesting. Um, you know, again, the grandmasters tend to gravitate toward lines where, you know, the computer thinks that they're doing pretty well. Computers are pretty good these days in the evaluation. So let's, let's go back through these moves once more. So if you're looking at the tabia of the main line of the main line for the McCutcheon, it's knight c3, knight f6, bishop g5, bishop b4. That's the key McCutcheon move. If you had played it one move earlier, it would be the winner. e5, h6, bishop d2. Important to remember now, you can't play knight e4 yet. You, you could resign. Bishop takes c3, b takes c3, knight e4. Queen g4, king f8, bishop d3, knight takes d2, king takes d2, c5. Where white has, again, these several moves. h4, knight f3, pawn takes pawn. I forget what the fourth one was. But uh, several moves... You want to learn it at least this far just to get started. Most of your opponents who play white will not be able to get this far. They won't know this. But when you start playing people that are closer to 2,000, you know, you will run into people that have their favorite lines against the McCutcheon. But when you're playing the lower rated players, the chances that you're going to get into this are very low. And right now, you know, Stockfish 10 is looking at this position. And 27 ply deep, it gives about minus 0.1. It thinks that black is slightly better, but really we could call it equality. But the fact that black has full equality already in the main line and the main line tells you what a good defense it is, and it's in complete justification of what Lester Shelton told me those many years ago. You know, the McCutcheon's a good opening, and sure enough, you know, black gets a good evaluation from the computer in these lines. Okay, so today we looked at a relatively rare variation of the French, but it's, you know, anytime the computer gives its okay to a, a line, it becomes more popular at the top levels because they realize that, you know, white can't get a big advantage. Now, is this maybe the kind of position the grandmasters want to play for black? They think they have good winning chances against lower rated players. Well, maybe they don't. And they say, well, it's good for equality, but it's not good for winning for black, so we still don't want to play it. That's always possible with openings for black. Good players want to play openings for black that not only give them close to equality, but give them good winning chances. You always have good winning chances when you're playing low-rated players. So a lot of lines that are not played by grandmasters in top grandmaster tournaments are wonderful lines to play at the lower level. This argument was made very strongly by Grandmaster Andy Soldis in his book, Secrets of Grandmaster Openings which is a really good book on uh, just general ideas on how to play openings. He has those two books, Secrets of Grandmaster Endgames, Secrets of Grandmaster Openings. They're both really two of his better books. I really like those two books by Andy. Okay, for uh, my YouTube series, this is Dan Heisman. Hopefully you got some ideas on the openings today, and maybe you'll give it a try. Thanks a lot. We'll see you next time. Bye.